fake a moon landing. NASA goes to Hollywood and they say, okay, we, we got to fake this moon landing. So what, what will it require? Neil deGrasse Tyson has struck again. The controversial astrophysicist has come with another shocking warning that is hard to shake off. Tyson has been in a state of panic ever since he got hold of declassified documents about a novel moon landing that happened right under our noses. The historic event was achieved by Odysseus, a scintillating spacecraft that beats whatever NASA had in its arsenal in the past. This latest NASA's invention crept up on us without us knowing, taking us back memory lane of how it felt when humans visited the moon and unearthing new discoveries in the process. What's so special about this new NASA spacecraft that has Neil deGrasse Tyson all worked up? How did this lander get to the moon in the first place? And what does this latest landing mean for the human exploration of the moon? Join us today as we uncover answers to these questions in this video titled, Neil deGrasse Tyson is panicking over declassified moon landing discovery. The Odysseus is one of NASA's most remarkable creations in recent times. This engineering masterpiece continues to win the admiration of scientists who can't get over the fact that the spacecraft is helping to write a new chapter in the history of man's exploration of the moon. Odysseus, which is officially known as IM-1, is a mission of the NASA Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program. But this is not the most exciting part of this story. Odysseus has entered NASA's Hall of Fame as the first commercial lunar landing project to land successfully on the moon. This historic milestone was achieved on February 22, 2024, exactly seven days after the lander said goodbye to our planet by launching from the famous Kennedy site. NASA engineers haven't stopped patting themselves on the back for this monumental achievement that started as a dream in December 2017. The prologue of this story was written when Space Policy Directive 1, the brainchild of the President Trump administration, signaled an intention for astronauts to return to the moon. As soon as this directive traveled from the Oval Office in Washington to the NASA offices and laboratories across the country, the resulting excitement was so stimulating that sister space agencies caught the fever too. This proposed program could only mean one thing. A new dawn was on the way closing in on us faster than we had imagined. There is no describing the happiness that NASA scientists felt because it's been decades since we were last on the moon. The last time humans were on the moon was in 1972. Surprisingly enough, it seems just like yesterday when Apollo 17 landed on the moon as the 11th and final mission of the Apollo mission. Now, decades after the trio of Commander Gene Cernan, Lunar Module Pilot Harrison Schmidt and Command Module Pilot Ronald Evans made their historic visit to the Earth's natural satellite. NASA was making another ambitious move to explore the moon firsthand. However, this time around, the music had a different tune to it. From the excerpts of NASA documents obtained by the New York Times, it was discovered early on that the agency would be working with the private spaceflight sector for this new mission. This development caused a massive ripple in the space travel sector as everyone waited in anticipation for the new wonder cooking in NASA's coffers. After almost a year of being kept in the dark and having our imaginations run wild, we finally got an idea of where NASA was headed. Sometime in November 2018, the space agency gleefully announced the Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program, selecting nine companies to deploy payloads for the agency and creating a renewed hunger in the hearts of hundreds of space engineers. A new mandate had been placed on their laps and they needed to put on their thinking caps immediately, and we got to see the result of these mental activities soon enough. In May 2019, NASA aroused the public's interest in this project when it came from the shadows to announce that astrobotic technology, intuitive machines and orbit beyond have been entrusted with the responsibility of developing lunar landers, awarding intuitive machines $77 million US dollars. 
The highlight of this public release was when NASA revealed that Intuitive Machines had been paid $118 million to develop the Odysseus lunar lander that will be used for the IM-1 mission. This news didn't catch experts off guard because it was obvious from the beginning that NASA was dead serious about bringing this lander within the next decade. You would agree that for NASA to release such a huge amount of taxpayers' money for this project then, the Odysseus Lunar Lander was expected to be a spacecraft like no other, something we'd never come across before. It just had to be different. From the design penned down by NASA engineers, after weeks of brainstorming and research, Odysseus had to be equipped with six instruments that were to be developed by the Space Agency. These instruments were meant to be the pillars that would elevate Odysseus above its predecessors and help it achieve whatever scientific investigation NASA chooses to entrust into its hands. The remarkable instruments fitted into the lander include a laser retroreflector array, a LiDAR navigation device, a stereo camera, a low-frequency radio receiver, the Lunar Node 1 beacon, and an instrument to monitor propellant levels. What's more intriguing is that these instruments are just a hint of what went down in creating the space aviation masterpiece called Odysseus. In addition, NASA engineers decided that a one-of-a-kind camera had to be placed inside the lander. It was a unanimous decision birthed during the design phase. Indeed, this camera is special because it was developed by students at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, Daytona Beach. NASA took the lander's design further by bringing on board a planned moon telescope, confirming Odysseus's status as the lander of the century. More so, a Jeff Koons art project found its way on board the lander. However, Koons' work is not the only artistic creation that got to visit the moon. The lander was equipped with a chip containing works of 200 artists, including Pablo Picasso, Michelangelo Buonarroti, and Bram Reinders. It's a long list that includes some of the top artists in the world. In fact, there is a high chance your favourite artist made the list. A recent release by NASA has been an eye-opener on the subject of the materials that were lucky to embark on this historic journey. From what we have been told, the lander took along with it Kuhn's famous sculpture Moon Phases. It is the first sculpture installation to reach the Moon since Paul van Hoedonk's fallen astronaut sculpture was placed on the Moon by David Scott of Apollo 15 in 1971. According to the description given by Koons himself, moon phases can be likened to 125 miniature moon sculptures, each approximately one inch in diameter. Besides traditional artistic works, literary artists are also represented in the lander. It seems Odysseus took the no man is left behind mantra personal because the famous lander carries the lunar library from the Arch Mission Foundation, containing the English Wikipedia and the GLL Lunar Prize mission content. It would interest you to know that the mission has its own motto, which read thus, Atigo Planitia Lunae, meaning, I reach the plains of the moon. The lander didn't leave the Earth without taking along with it a radio frequency mass gauge, RFMG payload. This payload was incorporated as one of NASA's ears when the lander was in flight. It was designed to estimate how much propellant is available during the IM-1 mission. Surprisingly, this is the first long-duration test of an RFMG on a standalone spacecraft. In total, the payloads comprise six NASA scientific instruments and six commercial instruments. Keeping true to NASA's objective of involving the private sector as much as possible on this project, Whoever coined the mission's motto deserves a Pulitzer because it seems to be the invisible hand that has helped Odysseus achieve its objective despite the landmine of difficulties that were placed on this historic journey. As soon as the lander was completed and certified, ready for the famous moon trip, NASA wasted no time in initiating pre-launch activities to prepare the spacecraft for the D-Day. One of the noteworthy activities on January 31st, 2024, was when the spacecraft was encapsulated in the payload fairing of its Falcon 9 Block 5 launch vehicle. As soon as NASA made this move, everyone could read between the lines and interpret the message that wasn't clearly spelled out. It was only a matter of weeks before the lander would embark on the highly anticipated travel.
By February 13th, two wet dress rehearsals loading Odysseus with propellants were successfully conducted, and IM announced that they were ready to launch, causing an uproar in the space aviation community. It was game time. History was being made right before our eyes. The launch date was scheduled for February 15th, 2024. That fateful day, NASA senior officials and engineers had big, bright smiles on their faces as they watched the Falcon 9 Block 5 launch vehicle carrying Odysseus being lifted off from the Kennedy Space Center Complex 39A. As everyone bade goodbye to the traveling spacecraft, the prevalent thought in the minds of scientists was, what new finding would Odysseus uncover in this maiden commercial visit? They followed Odysseus's journey religiously, monitoring its every step as it drifted through the adventurous travel path that NASA had conditioned it to pass through. Everyone's eyes were fixed on the lander as they waited in anticipation for the wonder that might unfold in the coming days. So, they were fully aware of the exact moment that the spacecraft parted ways with its launch vehicle and continued the journey on its own. As soon as this separation occurred, the Nova Control Operations Center wasted no time in establishing communication with the lander and conducting initial checkouts. The public didn't have to wait for long before we knew what the journey was like from the Odysseus point of view. The images the lander had captured after it was separated from its launch vehicle were released on February 17th. Scientists announced that the lander had been scheduled to perform a main engine commissioning burn on February 15th, but this plan had to be shelved for a moment. According to a statement credited to Trent Martin, IM Vice President of Space Systems, the proposed activity was a critical step for the mission. Things didn't go according to plan because it was reported that there were issues with the IM-1 Star Tracker. Nevertheless, the engineers wasted no time fixing this problem because adjusting the liquid oxygen line cooling time resulted in a successful commissioning burn on February 16th. This change in plan, or should we say manoeuvre, led to a 21 metre per second change in the lander's velocity. Another interesting revelation that only came out after Odysseus had left for the moon was the fact that IM had planned for up to three trajectory adjustment maneuvers during the trans-lunar phase of the mission. Fate seems to be in support of their plans because the first of these maneuvers was completed on February 18th. And surprisingly, after the second one was completed on February 20th, there was no need for a third. February 20th can be described as an auspicious day in the spacecraft's journey because IM informed the public that Odysseus had completed approximately 72% of its journey to the Moon's surface. The next day, February 21st, is equally a special day in this historic Moon visit because Neil deGrasse Tyson revealed that Odysseus performed a lunar orbit insertion (LOI) maneuver and that this action didn't occur without leaving a mark on the lander's journey. From the data decrypted by scientists, the LOI maneuver altered the lander's velocity by 800 meter per second. Furthermore, IM decided to give more insight about the ripple effect of this action. It revealed that the 408 second main engine LOI burn placed the lander in a 92 kilometer lunar orbit. A change in fortune occurred just a day later because IM reported that a lunar correction maneuver had lifted the orbit on February 22nd. From the report released by IM and NASA, the lander is said to have spent approximately 24 hours orbiting the Moon before its descent to the lunar surface on February 22nd. It is interesting to note that Odysseus's design made it possible for it to carry scientists along on this journey, leaving no room for second-guessing what is transpiring in space. The lander had earlier kept scientists abreast of what was going on while still in orbit by sending high-resolution images of the lunar surface on February 21st. In a swift move, IM adjusted the descent burn parameters based on data from the lunar orbit insertion burn. Furthermore, IM didn't mince words to reveal that the risks undertaken during the lunar landing phase would be a challenge. This revelation threw everyone off balance, causing hearts to race and minds to ponder on whether the landing would be successful or not. 
a hiccup had materialized from nowhere just when we were so close to achieving the historic goal. There had to be a way out. As scientists pondered how to salvage the situation, they discovered something shocking as the lander was being prepared for its touchdown on the moon's surface. There was an oversight error, one that had stayed hidden from their gaze all through the journey until that point. The investigative eyes of the mission controllers had determined that a safety switch on the primary laser rangefinder system had not been turned on during pre-launch preparations. Shocking, right? This was the thought on scientists' minds when they discovered that they had missed out on an important piece in the puzzle of safely landing the spacecraft on the moon's surface. In response, teams on the ground went to work immediately and soon came up with a solution. They found a way around the issue by reprogramming Odysseus to use data from an experimental NASA payload called the Navigation Doppler LiDAR for precise velocity and range sensing. Another iconic activity that occurred just before Odysseus landed was that the spacecraft deployed its Eagle Cam to record the lunar landing. Here's what happened. As soon as the lander was approximately 30 meters from the lunar surface, the spacecraft was meant to swing into action by ejecting the Eagle Cam camera equipped CubeSat. The Eagle Cam was meant to drop on the lunar surface near the lander with an impact velocity of about 10 meters per second. As soon as this was achieved, the next course of action was for the Eagle Cam to capture the first third person images of a lunar landing. You are probably wondering how we were meant to get these images after they were captured. Based on the Eagle Cam's design, it was to use a Wi-Fi connection to the Odysseus lander to relay its images back to the Earth. However, this plan never saw the light of day due to the complications that occurred with the lander's internal navigation system. The engineers had to make the hard choice of powering down the Eagle Cam during the landing and not deploy the device during the spacecraft's final descent. Nevertheless, the story is far from over because the IM and Eagle Cam teams still have high hopes of using the Eagle Cam to capture images of the lander on the lunar surface as the mission proceeds. Although Odysseus landed on the moon's surface on February 22nd, the journey had begun far earlier in 2020, when scientists had been debating on the choice of landing site. The favoured landing site was between the Sea of Serenity, also known as Mare Serenitatis, and the Sea of Crises, known as Mare Crisium. Thanks to previous moon visits, we were made to understand that Luna Maria are large plains formed when lava flowed into ancient impact basins. Later on, the Lunar Highlands location near the south pole of the Moon became the anointed landing site. This decision was born out of the fact that the region is believed to have a source of water for a future lunar base. However, this decision didn't last long because the tides changed in favour of the Malapair A crater area 300 kilometres from the lunar south pole. This new location was chosen because it appeared to be relatively flat and a safe place near the pole to land, amongst other considerations. Hence, when Odysseus began its descent to the lunar surface, it had already travelled down to the Malapair A crater area. Prior to its descent, the spacecraft had performed pre-lander tests to check if it was safe to land or not. The test's results were in the affirmative, so the Odysseus began its landing sequence at 6.11pm EST on February 22nd. As soon as it landed, controllers began to experience something strange. They were receiving faint communication from the lander. The shocking part of this moment is that they had wrongly assumed that the lander was in an upright position on the lunar surface based on stale telemetry. However, this thought took a backseat as soon as new details arose, igniting some fear in their hearts. Imagine the bewildered looks on their faces when they found out their beloved Odysseus had tipped over during landing, and surprisingly, its solar panels and instrumentation were functionally oriented. By February 23rd, I am reported that the Odysseus lander was alive and well, much to the excitement of the public. This news generated rousing applause from scientists and space engineers worldwide. 
NASA and IM had achieved no small feat. This was the first successful commercial lunar lander and the first to do it with cryogenic propellants. For now, scientists are keeping their fingers crossed as they keep watching the lander to see whether the scientific payloads can still be deployed. Hopefully, they don't have to wait for long before accessing this information. While the world has been so focused on the Odysseus lander and its monumental moon landing, NASA has been cooking up another exciting moon visit. Just like the Odysseus mission had been born from Trump's Space Policy Directive 1, it had also given birth to the Artemis program. The Artemis program is NASA's Golden Moon Exploration Program, with the objective of re-establishing human presence on the Moon for the first time since Apollo 17 of 1972. This is what sets this program apart from its sister program, the Odysseus mission. Another distinguishing feature between both programs is Artemis's long-term goal of establishing a permanent base on the Moon to facilitate human missions to Mars. It is evident that NASA wants to use one stone to kill two birds here. When NASA first announced this goal and its overall intentions with the Artemis program, some skeptics scoffed at the idea because it seemed like an impossible goal to achieve. However, this lofty goal that critics believed was too high for NASA to achieve is gradually being surmounted by the Space Agency. The first step in this direction is the fact that the crewed Artemis II spacecraft is expected to launch in late 2025. This would be followed closely by the crewed Artemis III mission scheduled for 2026. The Artemis program is not your average space program. It stands tall above most current space programs. The program is characterized by private sector partnership, just like the Odysseus mission. The two principal elements of this program are the Orion spacecraft and the Space Launch System, which is a reincarnation of Ares Fulv. The Orion spacecraft is an engineering wonder that would leave you in utter amazement. The spacecraft is a partially reusable crewed spacecraft that is designed by Lockheed Martin and the European Service Module, ESM, and manufactured by Airbus Defence and Space. The spacecraft is designed to support a crew of four beyond low Earth orbit and can last up to 21 days undocked. If you are intrigued by this latter information, wait till you hear that this craft is capable of lasting up to six months docked and is equipped with some of the most sophisticated equipment we can think of. Besides the Orion spacecraft and SLS, the other elements of the program include the Lunar Gateway Space Station and the Human Landing System. These other elements are being developed in partnership with other government space agencies and private spaceflight companies. Everyone is on board in ensuring that we achieve the collective dream of setting up a structured base on the Moon. And once this is ticked off the list, we can resume plans on visiting Mars from this new base. The exciting news is that it is easier for us to explore Mars from the Moon and possibly achieve the age-long human space dream of setting up an Earth colony on Mars in the future. Naturally, this dream would take a long time to achieve. But with the introduction of the Artemis program, the game has changed. We might just achieve this dream sooner than we anticipated. Thanks for watching this Voyager video till the end. For more exciting space discoveries, click the next video on the screen.